Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome to the Frisk Center for Visual Arts and our Food for Thought program, a partnership with Vanderbilt University. My name is Gail Carr Williams, and I am from Vanderbilt University. I'm just excited to see all of you today. I trust everybody had a wonderful, warm Thanksgiving. Yeah. Woo! I did too. It was absolutely wonderful. So uh, I'm glad to be back, though, and I'm glad to present this program today. Um, but before I throw it over to our absolute amazing panelists, I just want to remind everyone that it is indeed the holiday season and the gift shop. I walked in there today. Uh, you don't even have to go to the mall. Everything is in there, and everything in there is unique and beautiful. So uh, I just want to thank the Frist Center again for inviting all of us into this just beautiful, gracious space. And I think um, Susan Edwards is in our audience someplace who directs this absolutely fabulous place. Susan, thank you for the partnership and thanks for all you do for Nashville to bring arts into just a, uh, a great space and present all of this for our community. Thank you, Susan, if you are here. <laughs> so now, on to our Food for Thought conversation. I'm going to throw it over to our panel, which our uh, moderator is... Uh, a moderator this time. We just have three amazing people. Oh, Katie's our moderator. So, uh, Katie Del May is our moderator, and also on our panel is uh, Jenny Sankson and Seth Young Kim, who is a very new professor at Vanderbilt University, and just excited to have him and to be able to embrace him uh, in this Nashville community and welcome him to Vanderbilt and Nashville. So, at this point, Katie, I'll turn it over to you. You guys are in for an amazing treat today. So have at it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Gail, and welcome to everyone. My name is Katie Delmay, and I am the curator who oversaw the Frist Center's presentation of Samurai, the Way of the Warrior. Along the way, I have been very fortunate to have the guidance of my colleague, Jenny Sankston, Assistant Curator of Interpretation, whose area of expertise, unlike mine, is Japanese art. So I'm very grateful to her for serving on this panel, as well as to Dr. Seth Kim, who is a Mellon Assistant Professor in Cinema and Media Studies at Vanderbilt, and whose specialization includes contemporary East Asian and US film. Together, these distinguished panelists will examine how samurai came to play such an important role in popular culture, from Japanese-produced films like Seven Samurai, considered by many to be among the finest ever made, to American-born cartoons like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And then they will unpack how fantasy and fact often collide through these various formats. And from our earlier planning discussions, I promise you this will be a very lively and fun afternoon. Before we dive into that topic, though, I think it would be helpful to provide a very brief introduction to the samurai as a whole and to this remarkable exhibition. Samurai the Way of the Warrior explores much of the history and tradition surrounding these legendary figures, who were members of an elite military class that dominated Japan from the late 12th through most of the 19th century. The origins of the samurai can be traced back to the 8th century, when the emperor, based in the centrally located capital city of Kyoto, hired armed supporters to quash rebellions in outlying areas. By the 10th century, these professional warriors were referred to as samurai, which roughly translates to one who serves. Over the next 200 years, the samurai and their chieftains consolidated enough power to rival that of the emperor. And in 1192, he appointed Minamoto Yoritomo as the first shogun, or supreme military commander. From that point until the Meiji Restoration in 1868, 41 largely consecutive shoguns were the de facto rulers of the nation, with the emperor presiding in name alone. This prominent position for nearly 700 years naturally had a very profound impact on Japanese art and culture. This exhibition includes more than 90 beautifully ornamented objects related to samurai life, most with a direct connection to their military role, including nine full suits of armor, like the ones on the screen now. 
Armor for Elite Samurai has long been considered true works of art because of the high quality of its construction and the luxurious materials with which it was made. Materials such as bear skin, buffalo horn, horse hair, ivory, lacquer, and silk were all commonly used. Suits of armor were also creative visual expressions that were meant to reflect the individuality and wealth of the warrior who commissioned it. In fact, when not in use, armor was often displayed in the home to signify the samurai's power. As the most visible part of armor, and that typically seen first by an enemy, helmets were especially elaborately adorned. Decorations often included flat uh, antlers or horns, the crest or emblem of a clan, symbols of good luck, or demons meant to intimidate impo imposing forces, like the two on screen now. Samurai were highly trained warriors, skilled in cavalry and the use of multiple weapons. In early times, they mostly used a long bow, but the curved katana sword eventually became their primary weapon and is now what is most associated with the samurai. The stream, extreme sharpness of the katana blades is legendary, and sword making was, a, was revered as an important art form, with only the best craftsmen able to attain the desired perfect polish and the right balance between flexibility and stiffness. In the earliest years of the 17th century, after nearly 150 years of intense civil war, Japan entered a period of relative peace and prosperity as well as self-imposed isolation. Even though the samurai rarely saw a battlefield during this time, called the Edo period because the capital was in the city of Edo, now known as Tokyo, they still commissioned beautiful armor and helmets to keep on display and to wear in parades or processions. When the samurai class ceased to exist in the late 19th century after the emperor was restored to power and shogunate rule was abolished, the art market saw a flood of armor and other warrior accoutrements. This captured the interest of Frederick Stiebert, who was a British, born, a British citizen born in Italy, who was a major collector of European arms and armor. He began to focus on Japanese material, and his collection, now housed in a museum in Florence, is considered one of the oldest, largest, and most important outside of Japan. And it is from this museum, the Museo Stiebert, that all of the objects in our exhibition are drawn. This exhibition, like ones across the country, really underscores and reflects our enduring fascination with these complex historical, historical fi figures. So with that said, let's turn to today's more focused discussion. Um, this group of people have been of interest to many people around the world and immortalized in various tales for centuries. Jenny, can you tell us more about how the samurai became fictionalized in Japanese literature? Sure. So the warrior appears in Japanese stories um, for uh, many, many centuries before this, but I would argue that the um, emergence of the samurai as a fictional character came about through war tales, which are called gunki monogatari in Japanese. Um, these appeared in the late 12th century, and they were a little bit different than the stories that had come previously because they were history but with a twist. So you had historical characters, but they're engaged in these very heroic um, episodes and really displaying not only their fighting prowess but also their moral character. Um, Gunki Monogatari are told from the perspective of the warrior, so it gives insights into their thought processes and um, really gives them an opportunity to be shown in an idealized light. And um, this really hadn't been done previously, and uh, these tales also devoted a lot of time to exploring, exploring a warrior ethic. So these idealized heroes are unflinchingly loyal, brave in the face of death, and have a strong sense of personal honor. And this pair of byobu, or uh, screens, are in our exhibition, and this chronicles episodes from the tale of the Heike, which was one of these early war tales. Um, and there are memorable moments that are depicted in these screens, um, including a scene with one of the most noted and tragic figures, the gentleman on the black horse at the forefront of this little cluster. 
is Minamoto no Yoshitsune, and he was, again, the archetypal um, perfect warrior. He was a gentleman, he was incredibly brave. Here he's trying to retrieve his bow that has fallen into the water and risking his life to do so. Um, Yoshitsune is chronicled in these war tales as really being the perfect uh, warrior and gentleman. Um, we know that historically uh, his life didn't end so happy. He, was, he came into conflict with his brother, the Shogun, who was the first Minamoto Shogun, and his brother brought about his forced suicide, and his head was actually sent back to his brother preserved in a barrel of sake. So, uh, while well, you have these warriors being idealized in the stories, in reality you're dealing with backbiting and treachery. These are real people engaged in um, a whole host of conflicts and having a variety of motivations. Wow. Um, so, of course, the samurai continued to play a very important role in uh, Japanese politics. And from the 14th century onward, my understanding is that theater became increasingly popular and also helped to really cement this idea of the samurai as being, you know, a very heroic and noble character. Can you tell us a little bit more about their, um, how they figured in, in theater? Absolutely. So there's several different types of theater um, in Japan. Uh, one of them, if we can progress the slide, uh, the one on the left is called No, and this is a very... Uh, slow, deliberate, classicized form of theater, and warriors appear in this. Um, many of the stories date from the 14th century onwards, and you have warriors appearing both alive or as ghosts, as this character is. Um, we also have bunraku that you can see at the top. This is a form of puppet theater that emerged in Osaka in 1684, and many famous examples of samurai characters first appeared in puppet theater. Has anyone heard of the 47 Ronin? So that was originally a puppet play. Um, and then with Kabuki, which originated in the 17th century also, we have a live action performance that combines music and special effects and um, really over the top dramatic acting. And kabuki actors were the superstars of their day. So they were celebrated not only on the stage but also through woodblock block prints that would commemorate their roles. And um, Everything is really, really dynamic within Kabuki. So this medium is perfect to immortalizing the samurai, who are again depicted as impossibly brave, strong, and principled. And if we go forward, we can see the same character appearing in Bunraku in Kabuki and in woodblock prints that are commemorating a Kabuki show that occurred um, in the 17th century. So I think many of us, um, one component of samurai li life that we hear about is this concept of the Shudo or the way of the warrior, the title of our exhibition. Can you explain what Bushido means and how it was reflected, even promoted in Japanese literature? So Bushido is often defined as a warrior's code of honor that espouses loyalty to the Lord, bravery, and self-sacrifice. And it's a term that gets thrown around a lot in movies and TV, but it's not very well understood and it's also highly problematic. So while values of loyalty, duty, and bravery were certainly valued by historical samurai, these, this idea of a warrior code didn't appear until the peaceful Edo period, which Katie mentioned as being that 250-year period of peacetime. And during this time, you had warriors who were professional soldiers who weren't engaged in war. So uh, instead, they turned towards philosophy and really examined what it meant to be a warrior in times of peace. And I wanted to highlight these three gentlemen um, that really helped develop this idea of Bushido, which we see throughout uh, pop culture. Uh, the first reference to Bushido comes in the mid-17th century with Shido, the way of the warrior, by Yamaga Soko. And uh, Yamaga was a scholar and a military strategist. Um, obviously, he was a theorist, since it was peacetime. Um, and he was concerned about the deterioration of samurai during peacetime. So he outlined a role for samurai in Japanese society that combined moral cultivation, civic responsibility, and military preparedness. 
And then in 1716, we have the Hagakure, which is translated as In the Shadow of the Leaves by Yamamoto um, Tsunetomo. And this is a transliteration of his final thoughts that he gave to one of his followers. And it's from here that we get this idea of the way of the samurai is in death. Um, so uh, uh, Sunetomo thought that peacetime was really deteriorating the moral qualities of the samurai, um, and he saw this as being very detrimental to their way of life. And interestingly, the Hagakure did not become popular until the 1930s in Japan. It was really forgotten until that point. And then in 1905, we have Bushido, The Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. And this text was written for Westerners as a way to um, promulgate Japanese values. And it's from here that we have this comparison between Western chivalry and Bushido. Um, this book became wildly popular in the West and then was translated back to Japanese um, and was then embraced from there. So the concept of Bushido wasn't necessarily embraced in practice by all historical samurai. However, it's important to mention here because it's a huge influence on the fictional samurai that we're going to talk about today. Great. Well, obviously, there was a really rich tradition of featuring samurai in Japanese literature, theater, and other forms of visual culture. So it must have really been an, a natural subject for early, early films. Seth, can you tell us more about that history? Uh, yeah. The samurai as a figure was incredibly important in the establishment of Japanese cinema from very early on. And, and basically, uh, the samurai film can kind of be... Uh, grouped into two different genres um, referred to as the Jidai Geki and the Chanbara. The Jidai Geki just very uh, basically means a period piece as opposed to Chanbara. The Chan and Chanbara is supposed to refer to the, the sound effect of when a sword clashes with, with another sword. And so already between the two genres you can kind of see this split where the Jidai Geki is sort of more prestigious um, kind of seen, you know, sort of more along the lines of art, whereas the Chambara is seen as some, something a little bit more popular, a little bit more pulpy. And so that kind of tension between the two genres and how the samurai is understood as both high and mainstream low culture, um, this becomes really important throughout the sort of history of, of, of Japanese cinema. I think it's also really important to remember, too, because for one, a lot, of, a lot of film scholars have traced how Japanese cinema um, historically has sort of drawn on earlier traditions, everything that Jenny has been talking about so far, especially with the connection with theater. But it's also important to really remember that it's not necessarily um, a neat line or a causality or a progression that one thing led to another. Uh, one of the major themes that we'll see for the rest of the, uh, the panel is how movement is always occurring back and forth, let's say, between the U.S. and Japan and kind of going, uh, you know, further back into history but also thinking forward as well. So the director that I think most of us would associate with uh, samurai films, of course, is Akira Kurosawa. Um, how instrumental do you think he was in translating this um, image of the samurai for a U.S. audience? Um, yeah, Kurosawa, who has sort of become synonymous simultaneously with samurai cinema, but I think also with Japanese cinema, um, even now I think uh, he would probably be the filmmaker that's most associated with the country. I don't think there has been a filmmaker internationally since that's sort of um, taken his place. Um, and he's certainly drawing on this sort of earlier tradition of Jidai Geki and, and sort of really um, piggybacking on the cachet that the samurai film and, and the period piece had and sort of translating that into international sort of um, success. Uh, Rashomon in 1951 was really sort of crucial to this. Hidden Fortress will become crucial internationally because that's the film that's commonly uh, cited as the key inspiration for Star Wars, which will come in later. Um, and it was with Kurosawa in, during the 50s, along with um, Federico Fellini and Ingmar Bergman. They were really central to um, a burgeoning sort of awareness of interna international cinema in the 1950s in the U.S. Um, uh, you see here, this is actor Toshiro Mifune, who's also in both of the slides above. Uh, he's the film or the actor that becomes really synonymous as the sort of uh, uh, actor who who really portrays the samurai, not only in Kurosawa's film but in general as well. He's he's in a few other really high-profile films. Um, yeah. 
And Kurosawa really um, took off after the um, kind of tampering down on uh, war films that occurred during the occupation, right? right. So from 1946 to 51, was it? That right. there was really a push um, by the Americans against depictions of samurai on film. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, we kind of tend to forget this. I guess uh, uh, the internment camps are sort of in the, in the public discourse right now. Um, but the American occupation following the end of World War II in 1945 and up until 1953, it's, it is interesting, right, that this is all occurring at the same time when Japanese militancy was sort of disappearing from the public sphere because of the American occupation and sort of it's allowed to reappear in the cinema but simultaneously not as a contemporary, but like, a, again, you know, sort of invoking this sort of older tradition of Bushido, because that's mm -hmm. a little bit more palatable, right, than thinking about Japanese wartime and soldiers. Right, which happened in Japanese theater as well, you know, if the, you had a really good story that had occurred now, and you wanted to kind of cloak it in right. mythos, you would just set it back a couple hundred years and, and let people pick up on the subtext. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we have here, and this is really indicative of the movement that's happening, um, at, at the moment uh, between, you know, the U.S. And, and, and filmmakers in Japan and the U.S. in dialogue with one another. I mean, do you want to talk further? Because you're really sure. interested in this Yeah, I, I think this is fascinating. Um, I learned that Kurosawa was heavily influenced by um, Western films that were being produced in the U.S. So if anyone has seen Stagecoach, he, um, he said that John Ford had a huge influence on him. So you have Westerns influencing um, the production of Seven Samurai, and then the cycle continuing with The Magnificent Seven being a retelling of The Seven Samurai, and we just came out with a new one directed by Antoine Fuqua. Um, but there's a couple of things that you see in common between samurai films and westerns. Um, you'll have some disenfranchised heroes who are traveling around writing wrongs. You'll also have this lone warrior who kind of rides into town, saves the day, and then continues on his journey. How did this um, archetype of the noble lone warrior um, fighting against insurmountable odds really develop? I think we all can think of Clint Eastwood in, our, in the American Westerns, but how did that develop in, um, in Japan? I think it comes a lot from historical sources that have been um, fictionalized and mythologized. Um, one name that keeps popping up again and again in uh, samurai media is Miyamoto Musashi, who was a legendary swordsman and heavy on the legendary. Um, we have one definitive written source on him that he wrote himself. Um, so according to him, he was never defeated in battle. Um, he was incredibly proficient. Um, uh, there's a lot of stories that go along. I, he's kind of analogous to Robin Hood, you know. There might have been a historical figure, but we know a lot of the wonderful stories that came up after the character's death. Um, he was, he did found a school of swordsmanship that focused on Niten Ruru, or the two sword style, and um, the Book of the Five Rings, which often pops up in uh, samurai literature, he wrote that text, and uh, I love this print of him on the right-hand side of the screen. It's him fighting a Yamazane, or a mountain shark. I think, uh, on the, on the Speaking of Niten Ryu, it really reinforces the earlier point that you were making about, well, and, and throughout the exhibit too, that a lot of this was really ceremonial and decorative. And so Musashi is, is often um, cited as the first person to, and the Niten Ryu using the two sword style, he's the first person to use both weapons that all samurai carried, which begs the question I mean, up until Musashi, it wasn't really you know, common practice to use both the swords that you're always carrying. So it's, it's this, yeah. Um, right. and, and in a similar fashion, Musashi is often romanticized, and martial arts is really important to, I think, this conversation in, in a number of ways. But martial artists like to, to, to reference Musashi quite a bit because he had this practice of what was known as dojo breaking. So he would go to, or supposedly, right, this is according to him. Right. He would go to other <laughs> schools, he would challenge their teachers, he would beat all of them, and then that's how he spread his, uh, his art. Yeah. Does Musashi appear in films? Uh, absolutely. Um, again, this is Toshiro Mifune as Musashi in the Samurai Trilogy, another one of these um, uh, set of films, the very important Japanese films um, uh, that kind of become a centerpiece to Japanese national cinema, not directed by Kurosawa, but kind of holding a, an, an equal uh, part. 
This is a three-part trilogy of, um, that, that charts his life to the climactic battle here, the duel at Ganryu Island. Um, the other figure is uh, Sasaki Kojiro, who was another swordsman, a contemporary and equally um, famous swordsman at the time. Um, and that duel has a sort of very important place in Japanese culture. I mean, and again, it's another one of these things where we don't really know what actually happened. So there's a lot of conjecture and speculation, a lot of interesting uh, legends about, I mean, if you want to. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so according to this duel, he timed it perfectly. So he sailed into this island, you know, jumped off the boat, defeated his opponent, and then jumped back on the boat so that um, his opponent's supporters could not kill him. So then he sails off into the sunset. So it's really uh, poetic and gives a lot of credit to um, him as a savvy swordsman, oh, yeah, yeah. kind of using all of the elements around him to best his opponent. Um, and you gave a wonderful comment about um, sort of the actor bleeding into the mm -hmm. character that they're playing, about how Toshiro Mufune, uh, a lot of what we think we know about Musashi is really mostly about Toshiro Mufune. Yeah, I mean, it, this sort of thing still happens where you'll hear, um, I mean, even in the U.S., even now, stories of, of actors getting hate mail because people can't really differentiate between the, the character and the actor. And I think Mufune, and so similarly, you know, a lot of what we understand about Mufune, I think really can come back to not only these films, but really Mufune's work in general um, as the actor who sort of become, I mean, he, he has other films and that's why I really like this, the image from the earlier slide of him in, you know, contemporary clothing because it's, it's so odd because we're so used to seeing him wielding swords. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Musashi, so Musashi continues to kind of, um, uh, 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 spread throughout culture um, if we want to move. On the left, this is um, the popular video game franchise that ran from 1993 to 2008, uh, Samurai Spirits or Samurai Showdown in the US. Um, if you look at the two characters, they're fictionalizations of Musashi on the left and uh, Kojiro on the right. Similarly, what that stage, what the setting is supposed to be is supposed to be Ganyu Island. Um, on the right, you have Vagabond, which is a comic by the um, incredibly important artist Takihiko uh, Inoue. Who, it's also a fictionalization of, again, it tells broadly the same story as the Samurai Trilogy, but it's another one of these texts, because there's a lack of real historical sources, all of these texts can kind of come out and say, well, well we have the real story. I mean, our, our films do this as well, right? Like the, How convenient. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, there must have been other uh, lone wolf samurai that were popular in film and television in the, sub in, in the 60s and 70s, were there? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's, it's very interesting, we were talking about this earlier before the panel actually begun, um, but there's this, you know, on one side there's the association of the samurai, I mean, in the language itself as being devoted to the master, but at the same time you have this kind of um, individual agency that really kind of um, congeals in, in, I think, in cinema. And so if you look at the history of samurai cinema, especially popular samurai cinema, a lot of it comes down to who are the actual, you know, the heroes, the popular heroes. And, and one of them being Zatoichi, the blind swordsman, who had films from 1962 all the way to 1989, um, four seasons on television in 1974 to 1979, new films, um, a part of a new series, so they keep getting re, uh, remade and revamped up until 2010, including a 2003 remark by Kitano Takeshi, a remake by Kitano Takeshi, who is one of the more important filmmakers in the 90s and since. Um, and interestingly enough, it was, I mean, Kitano is more of an art house sort of international film festival uh, director, in, uh, not unlike Kurosawa, but uh, Zatoichi is his biggest commercial um, success, which really spo speaks to the point that Zatoichi still kind of has resonance with, with the Japanese. Um, I think another similar uh, would be Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, again, it's based on a comic. Um, and this has a series, the comics is public in publication from 1970 to 1967. It becomes published in the U.S. in 1987. And what you see over here is the U.S. release with new cover art by uh, comic artist Frank Miller, who becomes really important to the sort of importation of Japanese culture, especially Japanese martial culture in the U.S. Um, you have the film over here from 1972 to 1974. You have a series. And then uh, equally important to the importation of samurai into American visual culture is Shogun Assassin, which actually takes the first two Lone Wolf and Cub films um, and sort of compiles them into a new edited uh, compilation film. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Quentin Tarantino, who will come in later in the, in the conversation, 
he actually cites Shogun Assassin, the American importation, rather than Lone Wolf and Cub as, as a key influence. Um, and I thought it was interesting when we were talking earlier, you know, the characters of Lone Wolf and Cub and Zatoichi, they're not samurai per se. One is yeah. a, a wandering masseur and the other one is an executioner. So you still have um, the uh, bare bones of a samurai, you know, a very principled man who's very skilled with a sword um, being translated. Uh, so the, the details can change, but the archetype remains the same at its core. Right, and that's precisely why it can sort of there's a continuity between the samurai and the gunslinger, so it's, it's universal but still specific, and the specificities are those sort of indicators of what we recognize. It's like an aggregate effect, the samurai is a figure. It's, it's the armor or it's the sword, but, but they can kind of, it's variable, right? Which is precisely why we can have Keanu Reeves be one too, yeah, exactly. if needed. Yeah. <laughs> They're flexible. Yeah. Um, so how did all of this fantastic samurai imagery really move, shift from Japanese to American cinema, cinema and when would you say this really happened? I mean, yeah, I mean, not, not unlike the way that, you know, Kurosawa is really coming up in um, the post-occupation or the occupation period, post-war period rather, the, the periodization of all of this is really interesting because again, it's very hard to say it was one person or one film or one text. It's sort of all bubbling at the same time. And so what we have in the 1970s in the US is a, a, a sort of peaked interest in popular culture with martial culture. And, and of course, Bruce Lee was sort of really important to this. It's important to remember too that there's a kind of piggybacking or, or kind of an aggregate effect of, you know, an, a, a new interest in Hong Kong cinema that's benefiting also Japanese cinema. And so similarly, there's a big sort of move towards karate and, and sort of Japanese um, martial arts in the same way that there's an interest in kung fu and Chinese martial arts. And so you see here, um, Sonny Chiba, who will come up later again, Sonny Chiba is positioned another as another one of these sort of key figures and, and, and we could call it Jap Japan's response to Bruce Lee, that they wanted a similar not a, a, a period or a, mus or, a, um, or, a, or a sort of historical samurai, but like a modern martial artist. Um, and this sort of, we'll see that this sort of feeds into a really big way. I mean, this was mostly in the sort of grindhouse theaters, um, uh, but it starts to become much more mainstream through a, a few other key texts that's coming at this time. And speaking of mainstream, how about the influence of this film? Yeah, I mean, if we want, I mean, we could, we could talk for hours just about Star Wars, and, and not in the sense of how great it is, which it is, but, but in the way that Star Wars really changed a lot. Um, and, and I think that Star Wars was really instrumental into kind of searing into our collective brains certain sort of, again, these sort of markers of the samurai, um, whether it's the robes or the, or the Bushido, the force, these sort of like, you know, new wave mystical, you know, ideas, um, the samurai armor, the swords, of course, I think I'm just repeating myself at this point, but um, yeah, and, and this sort of, I think, for a lot of people on, on a very widespread scale was probably the major first introduction to a lot of these sort of images. Yeah, and even the, the word Jedi um, appears from Jedi, so the Jedi Geki. Um, the influences are myriad, and if you look at the costumes especially, it was a huge influence upon um, samurai arms on the costumes. So have a look at this kabuto, which is in our exhibition, and then let's look at this image. So you can see, you can practically overlay the two and they'd be exactly the same in shape, and that's certainly no accident. Um, they're taking uh, visual um, symbols and inserting them into a futuristic setting, and it influences how we perceive the characters. So how do we feel when we look at a suit of armor? Quite intimidated. Um, they're very imposing. We get the same thing from the costume of Darth Vader. Right. Um, so, in addition to film, the samurai culture had a, was um, really impacted comic books. Is that correct? Could you tell us a little bit about that and Frank Miller? Yeah, absolutely. There was this really interesting sort of, if you, if, I mean, we're already talking about this in a way where there's like an interplay and a kind of constant movement between, let's say, the mainstream and the kind of more marginal. And it's important to remember that in comic books, especially in the 70s and 80s, 
this was still kind of more of a niche interest. It's, it's unimaginable now where we're now inundated with superheroes, but, but then this was still a kind of smaller audience that was already sort of um, kind of being, you know, engaged with these materials. And I think the, the influence of, again, uh, artist Frank Miller was sort of crucial to this because he was the one to start introducing Japanese elements into American comic books, or, or the one that sort of really had the, the biggest impact, How, not only beginning with his Daredevil run and sort of making that um, important to the, to the mythos of the character. We see this in the recent uh, Netflix Daredevil series, too, that you start getting that really in the second season. And certainly with um, the incredibly important uh, character Wolverine. Um, and it's precisely through Frank Miller's comics that then he starts to influence other people that then have, I think, an even bigger impact, um, which brings us to Ninja Turtles. Yes. <laughs> because Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it's really important to remember that this is occurring, you know, in 1984. Ninja Turtles was originally conceived as a parody of what was popular in the comics at the time. Because Teenage Mutants were X-Men, which Wolverine was one of, and then you have the ninja that were coming out of. Uh, of Daredevil. And so I think, I mean, really the impact of, of Ninja Turtles and how, how humongous it was at the, at the time, and I think it really occurs, not with the comic book, because the comic book was a, was a small independent thing, but when it gets picked up as a cartoon series, which runs all the way into 96, 1996, so nearly 10 years, which then get produced into feature films, and of course it's all been recently resuscitated. Um, this is a really interesting example, and that's the other thing that, that I guess I haven't explicitly spoken about, but you can already see that there's, we're talking about ninja, but it's, uh, again, all of these things are sort of bubbling at the same time, where it's ninja, samurai, even Hong Kong and Chinese traditions. There's just a general interest in sort of these martial, martial traditions at the time, um, which brings us to the next. Yes. And if we could pause here for a moment, oh, I was sure. just thinking, um, in thinking about Ninja Turtles, as you do, um, one element that always comes up in the comics, in the cartoon series, in the feature films, is this idea of family and being loyal to, to their family that they've created. And um, that ties into the concept of giri, or duty, loyalty, which appears in um, texts about Bushido. So again, it's taking these ideas and just you know, tweaking the details. You know, we have turtles instead of humans. Um, but they're practicing the same um, the same belief system. So you're adopting elements of what suits the story. Okay, well, I was a child of the 80s, and I certainly remember this film well. Um, Seth, could you talk a little bit about um, The Karate Kid? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this was... I think already benefiting from sort of the explosion of, of the interest in karate um, and Asian martial arts, but it's certainly, if, you know, after this film, many, many, many po more people started enrolling. Um, and again, you kind of have this sort of modern interpretation. He's not a samurai per se, but he embodies the sort of ideas of the samurai. And, and so Pat Morita's depiction of uh, Mr. Miyagi kind of become really important in this period. Again, uh, to a huge, huge sort of uh, uh, level of interest in, in, in perpetuating in um, not only martial arts, but certainly with Japan. I mean, you have an interesting point about Mifune. Oh, yes. So um, Mifune of um, Kurosawa fame, who we talked about, he's in Seventh Samurai, he's in Yojimbo. Um, he actually did a read for Mr. Miyagi and was seriously considered for this role. Um, and the director felt that he was too serious and that he was just kind of playing a Kurosawa samurai um, in California. So they, uh, they went with Pat Morita, who was a comedian by, by trade. Um, to give it a little bit of levity. He was in uh, Happy Days. Yes, he was in Happy Days. <laughs> um, and also, interestingly, um, Pat did not go by Noriyuki at all during his professional career. It was added in by the producers because they wanted to emphasize his Japanese heritage with this role. Very interesting. Well, a very different manifestation here is the, the Power Rangers. Um, can you tell us a little bit about their history? Yeah, I mean, it's... Even though one is tempted, I mean, one doesn't want to read history, you know, as, as, as simply sort of a, a causal line. It's, it's very interesting how it's almost like one series will fall off 
and then in another will pick up. So like when Ninja Turtles was kind of fading, this is when Power Rangers really occurs in 1993. Um, interestingly enough, Power Rangers is based on a Japanese franchise, a long-standing Japanese franchise that goes all the way back to 1975. And again, it's not something that's like immediately evident. Like how could the like how could the samurai or ninja, for that matter, be related to this material? But it's precisely like what's happening in Japan. This occurs again after the post-war period when they're not really allowed to talk about their sort of martial traditions, their sort of nationalist traditions. So they, they rework it and they make it into something that's, you know, ostensibly children's entertainment. But, you know, they're doing basically sort of uh, historical Japanese martial, you know, martial arts. And so in 93, when Haim Saban imports it and changes it to Power Rangers, this, is, this, you know, this initiates another huge boom and another real interest in Japanese martial arts. Again, kids are going to karate. Um, and if you, if you look on the side, so over here, that's the original 1993 Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Over there, I believe this is the 2000, I want to say, 8 or 9. Yeah, um, I think Super that's Sentai. Samurai. Yeah, yeah, the Samurai Sentai. Right, that's it was called Shinkenger. So they have a, a theme every year, and if those were, for example, the dinosaur theme, but this one was explicitly samurai themed. And when they imported this as Super Samurai, see now there's a sort of general understanding and an assumption, like all children are going to know what you know what the samurai are, so they can just call them samurai at this point. And this is, I think, one of the real interesting things that we're interested in. And you'll notice that they're all holding swords. How impractical is it to be fighting aliens with swords? Um, <laughs> but you never see um, the presence of guns being incredibly reliant in these series. Mm -hmm. It's always about the sword. You know, they have exactly. a, a giant sword that their, their zord carries during the big conflicts. Um, so very much mythologizing the idea of the samurai again, just tweaking the details slightly. Well, speaking of swords, I must admit I've been really shocked whenever I've taken groups through our exhibition at how fascinated everyone is by, by the swords in our show. Is, and they've, many people are actually quite knowledgeable about the swords and how they're made. And um, I'm wondering if this fascination with the swords specifically, if it's really been encouraged and reinforced in American films in particular. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I would have to give credit to, I can't remember who it was, but someone brought up in the initial conversation when we were developing this, they brought up Kill Bill. And then it occurred to me, and I was thinking about it, I, I would argue that Kill Bill is probably the first moment in American cinema where a really large audience was sort of exposed to the katana in a very explicit way. And that's not to say, there. I mean, as we've already seen, the katana was in American culture up until this point. I think an earlier example I found was um, there's a katana in, in Highlander, which is 1986. Um, and then there are other films. Uh, the one that I remember is the Jean-Claude Van Damme genre film, Cyborg, he carries a katana. But this was the film that a lot of people saw and, 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 and had this huge audience where the katana becomes a central plot point. And so they talk about not only the sword, but the process of the sword, the meaning of the sword, the soul of the sword, right? And so I think this went a really long way into sort of elevating um, the idea and the image of the sword for, for many in the U.S. And if anyone hasn't seen Kill Bill, um, it is a, a revenge, a very bloody revenge movie. Um, but her revenge cannot um, occur until she's gotten this sword. So um, she pauses essentially in the middle of her journey and goes off to get this sword. And to it's Japan, only, right? She to goes Japan, all the way yeah. To she, Japan. Goes, she goes to Okinawa where we have um, Hattori Hanzo, who is um, the name of another mythic samurai that they've transliterated into a, a modern character. And he forges her a sword expressly for the purposes of seeking revenge. Well, so in addition to Kill Bill, of course, there was another very big film that came out in the early 2000s that really glorified samurai culture. Anyone want to talk about this one? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it, I mean, again, the, the periodization is interesting because Kill Bill is happening in 2003 and 2004, the two parts. Last Samurai was 2003. I don't think it's imaginable that these films, such big Hollywood films, could have been released even 10, 20 years ago. There was something to the sort of general cultural understanding of, of, of what the Samurai is. But this is probably one of, again, like the most major film to kind of really explicitly talk about it to a widespread American audience. And there's a, I mean, for me, I'm very interested in the way in which, like, you know, every time I bring up The Last Samurai in the classroom, you know, it, it, the students sort of tend to laugh at it. But it's important to remember that, you know, 
uh, what is this? 13 years ago, this like it, it was it was an incredible prestige picture. You know, it was I mean, what are the stats? It was nominated for for four Academy Awards, including supporting actor, art direction, costume design, best sound, and it it did a really large part in in uh, launching the international uh, art film career of, of of Ken Watanabe. And so I mean, you know, it, it, to us now, you know, we're kind of I think we're. We, we kind of understand that there's something sort of absurd that, that Tom Cruise is the, is, is the actor in this. But, uh, you know, I mean, 2003 wasn't that long ago. And uh, this is based on a historical story. So it's based on uh, the last conflict between uh, samurai and the imperial forces. And um, if you watch this film, you're probably going to come away with a slightly inaccurate view of um, that conflict. Um, but the story behind it is quite interesting. And the character played by Ken Watanabe is inspired by a historical figure named Sago Takamori. Um, who was incredibly nationalistic, um, and he, his conflict had more to do with the fact that Japan wouldn't invade Korea rather than wanting to take an ideological stance against people corrupting the emperor. Um, but I found it interesting in researching him that the historical Saigo was always depicted in Western uniform. Um, his forces used howitzers and rifles, and um, you can see obviously here they have completely changed that. He's quite traditional. He fights with a sword for um, the majority of the film, um, and it's all about emphasizing tradition and um, uh, this idea of Bushido as something that's been practiced and codified for quite a long period of time, which we know is slightly inaccurate. And uh, we do have a clip that we yes. wanted to show from this. <laughs> What else has she told you? You have nightmares? Every soldier has nightmares. Only one who is ashamed of what he has done. You have no idea what I have done. I don't want that. You have seen many things. I have. And you do not fear that. But sometimes you wish for it. Is this not so? Yes. I hope so. It happens to men who have seen what we have seen. And then I come to this place of my ancestors. And I remember like these blossoms. We are all dying. To know life in every breath, every cup of tea, every life we take, the way of the warrior. Life in every breath. That is Bushido. So you can get from this clip that we very much have um, an emphasis on this historical code coming through. And it's interesting to, to go back and read what actually happened and then watch the movie again with a slightly different lens to it. Yes. Wow. Well, OK, one last question before we open things up to, to you, our audience. Um, samurai films are, of course, very much alive and well in both the United States and Japan. Uh, there was the new Magnificent Seven movie that we mentioned that opened just a few weeks ago. There is another retelling of 47 Ronin uh, that uh, uh, I believe was in 2013. Do either of you have more uh, contemporary films that, or recent films that you'd like to, to mention or plug for the rest of us? Uh, this is certainly my pick, and um, all of my colleagues know that I just will not stop talking about this film. I love it a lot. It's very gory. If this is not your cup of tea, I would stay away. Um, this is uh, Takashi Miike's 13 Assassins, which is from 2010. And I like this film not only um, from a story standpoint. You have a horrible, debauched villain and a group of lone warriors who are trying to stop him. Um, it's really beautifully shot. It's a lot of fun. And it also um, is a little bit more real. We still have very archetypal characters, um, but it's a bit grittier. And I wanted to show just a brief clip from this. Hold on. 
足を払え、えー、戦に武士道も卑怯もない、えー、そうだ剣がなければ棒棒がなければ石石もなければ拳でも足でもつかぬ己が命を失おうとも相手をご体満足にしておくな So a lot of fun, and that one is on Netflix. So if you want to go home and watch something, you can do it. Awesome. Seth, how about you? Any recommendations? Um, Whoops. Excuse me. Yeah, one of the... the uh, samurai films don't really get made as much anymore. I think they're seen more as a, a sort of box office risk. Um, so, uh, I mean, certainly in Japan. And so Rurouni Kenshin, the Rurouni Kenshin series, was one of the rare instances very recently where they've, they've produced samurai films. But even then, it's not technically... Well, it is and it isn't because it's based on an incredibly popular comic book series in Japan, uh, Rurouni Kenshin, which ran from 1994 to 1999, and then an animated series from 1996 to 1998. Um, and this is kind of riding a wave of um, comic book films, both in Japan, which I think can, again, we can see it's another instance where we see the influence of the U.S. and sort of the litany of American superhero films. Um, you know, J Japan's sort of doing the same thing. And these are... Um, uh, it's interesting because, you know, the comic and the, and the cartoon is actually incredibly fantastical, but they can't make it too fantastical, even as much, I think, as the 47 Ronin. They have to sort of still play by the samurai film rules. So it's, it's an interesting sort of, again, kind of where, uh, instance where you see the tension. And, 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 and there are a lot of different things that on the checklist that you have to kind of meet and I think this these films really do that and interestingly this is set in the Meiji period so after the abolition of the samurai class um, so you very much have that tension between modern and traditional in these films right, right. which is exactly the, the the anxiety and the tension between east and west yeah. okay well thank you both so much that was so informative um, <laughs> I suspect many of you may have questions for our panelists. Megan is roving with a microphone if um, you'd like one, uh, and Anne as well. But here, there's a question in the front row. Yes. Oh, what's the all along the samurai? Here, can you repeat oh, it into the. Did the samurai fall on his sword? Ah, um, so, so the idea of um, suicide in Japan, um, so yes, there, there is a long and complex history of suicide in Japan. Um, it was not seen as shameful as it is in some Western societies. It was seen as an honorable death, um, particularly if you have the option of being captured and humiliated by your enemy or going out on your own terms. It's, it's natural which one you would choose. Um, so there are many instances of samurai committing suicide, and it appears many times in fiction. Um, Katie mentioned the 47 Ronin with Keanu Reeves. Um, there's a, a very big suicide scene in that. Yes, a mass suicide. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of wonderful um, research that's been done about um, the tradition of seppuku or harakiri. Um, and there is a film called Harakiri, which is wonderful. We have a clip of it showing in our galleries. And if you, if you want to know more about it, I encourage you to watch that film, either the 1950s, uh, 1962 version, is that Harakiri? Is that 1962? Or the remake. Yeah. One Question moment. in the middle. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, women in the film and women being main protagonists in, you know, samurai film or martial arts inspired films. There's part of the exhibit that speaks about this too, right? Yeah, so, um, it's interestingly, samurai is a masculine term. So when we talk about women, uh, women samurai, um, we're talking about women of the samurai class. So there were instances where women did fight. Um, I'm trying to think about depictions in pop culture. Well, I mean, that's part of, at least in the, what, what they can do in film is um, they can play with these things. They don't have to, to, to abide by it. And I think, I'm thinking specifically, I mean, you guys were the ones that bring up Lady Snowblood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So especially in the 1970s genre cinema, even in the, in the Lone Wolf and Cub series, you'll have 
Women will usually play assassin roles, especially mm -hmm. in the ninja in the ninja series too. So they can't be part of the noble class, but that doesn't mean that they're not. Um, that right. they're, they're not killing people. They're yeah. killing people too. Certainly, they're not only victims in these. You, films. you have the option of being like either a princess or an assassin in yeah, a lot of yeah. <laughs> media. Uh, but uh, there's a basis for Kill Bill. That's what Kill Bill was yeah. all drawing on. To I mean, then it becomes kind of an exclusively female. But I think there there are Japanese examples of that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there, uh, there's a station in our education gallery that talks about the role of women um, in the samurai class. So there's a, there's a wonderful history to draw from, but yeah, the, the depictions are heavy on the side of fiction rather than fact. Other questions? I see a hand over here. One of the first films that you uh, showed was the date of 1927. Now, in film history, that's just on the verge, I guess, of talkies. I think maybe first American film talkie was about that. So were there a lot of films that were silent films in that's Japan? And then was there any kind of a change when they got to the talkie part? One of, the, one of the, the major components of early Japanese cinema, and, and this is where a lot of scholars will make the connection with earlier theater, was um, they had narrators. Um, so they were silent, but not in the actual exhibition. Um, there, were, there would be someone orating and... and, and Live? I, yeah, okay. exactly. Um, so it would be simultaneous. And wouldn't some of the early narrators kind of insert themselves into the story, like they would don characters and kind of take over parts? Right, right, yeah. yeah. There, there's, I mean, I mean, and we have, the, I mean, even in Kabuki, right, there's a tradition of male performers performing female parts, right? right? Mm -hmm. So there's a similar kind of fluidity. I mean, this is one of the interesting things about Japanese cinema is I think that there, in some ways, there are more rules to American cinema. Um, you know, like tonal shifts is one, and, and that sort of... There's a, and I think that's, I mean, it comes into the issue of history, too, is that the rules of representation are a little bit more looser. There's not an expectation that film has to directly match what we understand reality to be. Yeah, and, and in the light of those silent films talking about women um, on, on screen, a lot of the early female parts were played by men, by kabuki actors who specialized in female roles. Any more questions? Thought I saw a hand over on that side. Well, maybe not. Oh, <laughs> here we go. Uh, this is kind of disjointed because I've got a jumble of different thoughts. But um, I think it's interesting that uh, samurai, as a group of people that I would call uh, uh, psychotically evil and demonic, uh, homicidal maniacs, um, can be so fantasized, and um, I, I think it's, and I invite comment on a couple points I'm going to make. One is that uh, it strikes me that the interest in this uh, is in um, inverse proportion to the masculinization of, uh, of American and Western culture, which is to say we have more interest in this stuff uh, as society is progressively feminized. Uh, and I, I would invite um, comment on that, that, uh, 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 you know, the, the themes of violence, of uh, loneliness, of uh, heroes, of people with uh, uh, super abilities. That's one. The other is that I, I think it's interesting that this stuff flourishes, uh, despite our experience in World War II of the atrocious conduct um, uh, against American prisoners of war, uh, and the, uh, the typical justification for this, or smoothing over it, is saying, well, this reflects Bushido uh, in, um, in the Japanese military, uh, as opposed to uh, something else. Uh, but we get this, this tendency, but uh, there's been no similar thing by way of glorifying a, a parallel uh, military elitism um, uh, and psychotic evil, namely the SS uh, in Germany. Uh, so I would invite comments on those two things, for sure. Well, I can uh, certainly, I, I know Seth can speak to, to violence and media a little bit better than I can, but um, for, to your first point about um, samurai being um, 
psychotically evil. I think that's painting with a rather broad brush. Um, we're talking about real people. There were certainly some individuals who were um, very bad. There were other individuals who were very noble. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's good to avoid broad generalization when you're talking about any group of people, um, even one that is uh, long past and obviously very mythologized. But did you want to speak to, to violence? Yeah, anything? sure. Um, I, I think in general, we all are very good at um, bracketing things and or um, kind of picking and choosing what we want to think about and see. And I think you're absolutely right in the sense that it is important to remember that these are, you know, militant traditions. But I would, I would argue it's similar, you know. Um, there are certain things, uh, egregious things that, you know, we of a country have done and we don't really focus on in the media. There's something really palatable about the things about the samurai. And that's exactly, I mean, kind of one of the things that I was talking about is that this, this is emerging, emerging right after the post-war period, or in the post-war period, where they're not talking about contemporary Japanese militant, but they're still talking about the military. They're just talking about something, and you know, incredibly uh, 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 older than that. And I mean, similarly, it's, it's, I mean, I think the answer to your question is that it really comes down to where were um, the political connections between Japan, the political relationships between Japan and the US is incredibly important to this. And, and one example that we brought up that didn't come in the talk is, um, what was also happening in the 1980s and 90s was a really incredibly strong anti-Japanese movement because of the death of the American auto industry. And if we remember in 1982, you know, Chinese-American engineer Vincent Chin was beaten to death because they thought he was Japanese. And there was resentment towards the death of the American auto industry and what was happening with Honda and Toyota, et cetera, et cetera. So there's always like these sort of really interesting ebbs and flows where there's resentment towards Japanese uh, cars, but some Japanese culture is coming in. And then, but now, for example, the countries are in a completely different place, which is why we can have films like Kill Bill or um, The Last Samurai produced in 2003. But I'm saying, like, in 1982, those films would have been picketed. Um, because, you know, like, you know, our memory kind of, you know, it comes and goes, right? Or we, or we like to think about certain yeah. things and other... And you mentioned that, you know, Ninja Turtles kind of came about because it's, um, it, it's taking some aspects yeah. of samurai culture and Japanese culture, but it's filtering them through a fantastical lens. So it's, um, it's touching on some ideas and, um, and shying away from others. So it's, yeah, interesting, as you I said. I mean, uh, when was Letters from Iwo Jima? It was like 2000... It was well into the 2000s. So it's a similar thing where it's like, you know, yes, we don't have depictions of um, uh, Nazis, but at the same time, we do have depictions, uh, let's say, uh, sympathetic depictions of Germanic culture, just not specifically the Nazis. Similarly, it took ne ne you know, nearly 40, 50 years to get a film to talk about the Japanese military. Um, you know, the, the, again, like, we can, like our sympathies can shift, right? Well, I think the big takeaway that we've um, learned today is that the samurai have a very nuanced and complicated history, yet one that continues to really be of, of interest today. I hope that you will have a chance to learn more about the samurai through our exhibition that you can visit through um, early January. We also have a few more installments in our um, samurai film series. Um, check out our website for specifics on that. Uh, I want to thank you again, Seth and Jenny, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us today. And many thanks to, to you, our audience, for, for joining us.